Hey there, uh, Peter Favre, I am here. Uh, and I am uh, today uh, in continuation of this fantastic series of interviews that I have the great fortune of doing uh, for Green Hill School and with our amazing alums, uh, get to talk with our first musician. Uh, All right. <laughs> yep, uh, Stephen Edwards, uh, a highly regarded film and television composer, an accomplished pianist who's playing you've uh, probably heard on some of Hollywood's top soundtracks, and a 1980 graduate of Green Hills School. Stephen, uh, his acclaimed orchestral and choral compositions have been performed at Carnegie Hall and the Vatican, Vatican which we'll hear about in, in a bit, and he recently started producing his own films and is working on a number of projects that he'll also talk about in a few minutes. His first feature length documentary, Requiem for My Mother, was released by American Public Television in 2017 and earned high critical praise, including from composer and friend of Stevens, John Williams. The film was inspired by his mother and musical muse, Rosalie Edwards, who also inspired hundreds of Green Hills students as our school's first chorus director. That's right. Prior to Stephen's life as a celebrated composer and musician, Stephen studied at Interlochen. I bet we might have been there at the same time wow. and uh, attended Lawrence University after graduating from Green Hills. Stephen, welcome. It's so good to see you again. Delighted to be here. It's uh, great to see you and the uh, familiar uh, cinder blocks in the background. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you know what? The forum, that's that's the forum where you used to sit with probably, yeah. uh, who was it? Jim Gramatine, right? The like, carpet was greener. I yeah, had Ed Reed for one year. Oh, Ed, that's right. And then Gramatine for the rest. Fabulous. So, yeah. Um, well, I'd love to take you for a tour around, but maybe some other time. But yeah, please come back and visit. As soon in as person, possible. absolutely. I would glad, yeah, I'd be it, glad. You know, it's only you know, 38 degrees, the sun is out. So uh, not as nice as uh, Los Angeles. I won't, yeah, I won't even divulge it because you <laughs> okay, get that. Thanks. Well, listen, I, you know, you're, you're not only, you know, everyone, uh, all of the people who are going to be looking at this and our students who are going to be looking at it, um, they're all familiar with um, film music uh, and, and, and composition without even knowing it. Right. right. And and so can you talk a little bit about that process of composing it? And uh, I, I think it's it'll be fascinating to hear, you know, do you watch the film first? Is there an idea before it goes in? Do you write the music first and make it fit to anyways? Tell us about how it happens. All of that. Well, it's like, again, not to quote John Williams and keep dropping his name, but his, I love a quote he said, which is uh, music would survive without movies, but movies wouldn't survive without music. Um, and it's mostly true. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a giant uh, part of filmmaking and it is, it, it plays a role in so many different ways in filmmaking. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's original scores written for just about every program that you see. You know, there's 400 television shows on the air right now plus all the big, you know, the Marvel movies and all the event movies and all the movies that are playing on, you know, the streamers, which have basically taken over the business. Amazon and Netflix are now the major players. Um, so, you know, my role is to, uh, I mean, the last, the four projects that I kind of working on at the same time right now, the music plays a different role in all four of them. Um, mm -hmm. I just scored a horror feature called uh, Wolf Mountain, which is sort of a classic horror film score. Um, they gave me the finished cut with no music in it, and I decided where the music was going to go. And I wrote, you know, seventy minutes of original score to the to the image uh, at the director's, uh, you know, with the director sitting there or approving things, changing things, asking for more scares, asking for more accents or you know different kinds of things. But I made most of the musical decisions. And then, um, like, I'm working on a reality show, a new reality show for Peacock that's coming on this fall called Pride and Prejudice. And it's basically Bachelorette meets Bridgerton. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be really good. And it's beautifully shot. It's shot in a castle. It's basically the Bachelorette shot in a castle in the 1700s. So it's back to the old school. You know, parents are there. It's much more formal. 
and the music and is, is it contemporary sounding music or are you going no, back to period. yeah i'm writing music that sounds like vivaldi meets mozart meets you know beethoven it's 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 wow. pulling up all my classical chops and there's some modern sounding things in there too but um it is definitely it is definitely period very mm -hmm. formal and there's actually a lot of waltzing going on right um, and there's actually a string quartet on stage that's playing the music that i wrote wow. so um it's wow. very unusual uh, wow I've that's never kind done of show even trippy. close to being like this so um and so that and then um i'm i'm also producing a broadway album uh, Broadway is obviously uh, has, has gone off the rails during COVID, but I'm working with a singer songwriter called Emily Richards, who is writing a show called Babylon. And so we're doing the model that um, it's happened a few other times. Les Mis actually did it where the, the soundtrack is being produced before anything goes to the stage. So two nights from now, we're recording a string section with a Moscow symphony for one of her songs. I didn't write the songs. I just produced them. I just basically am making them sound you know, professional and putting my my sort of film score musician stamp on them. Right. Um, so that, and then I just worked on a really cool Apple movie called Skies Everywhere uh, that's going to be premiering on Apple, um, I think around Christmas. And it's a story yeah. of a clarinetist. It was actually, the original title was Clarinet, but now they've changed it to Skies Everywhere, which is based on a book. And it's about a high school kid who's a clarinetist whose older sister dies very suddenly and has to sort of come out of her shell. And she falls in love with a boy and it's a um, really talented director named Josephine Decker, who is going to be massive, I think. And right. so I wrote a lot of music for the, I didn't write the score, but I did a lot of the stuff where she's actually playing on camera. Right. You know, we did Mozart clarinet concerto, Weber clarinet concerto. We did a Bach piece. We did some other original stuff of mine. So yeah, well, it's been a sort of a whirlwind. You sound busy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, uh, again, I'm going to keep, burrowing in here. So just using any of those as an example, like a Netflix, you know, let's say I have a, you know, let's say I'm a, uh, a well-known uh, producer or director or whatever. And I, I, um, I have this idea for a show or a movie and it's going to be a blank kind of movie. When do you come in? Like, wait, like, do they, are you in at early stages and then is is it shot and then you watch the film on a screen and i how does generally it speaking yes like uh this reality show they've shot the whole season it's 13 episodes and they've only cut one of them so um um basically i'm writing to the visuals okay, for the most part. okay. um in movies it's mostly that um there's once in a while i'll do a pre-record or two like there was a movie I did where there was a prisoner playing a harmonica in, in a scene. So we actually pre-recorded their harmonica and then they went to Bulgaria and shot the movie and the actor just mimed, right? So he learned how to mime to the piece and they shot to playback. So oh, that it looks okay. somewhat authentic. Got it. Um, that's always works best because right. all of us have seen movies and TV shows where they don't sync and like they see a guy blowing into something and there's no noise coming out. And so mm -hmm. I always try to say like, come on, get me in, get me involved early. And we'll make this work and we'll make it sound right. And uh, it's it doesn't cost you any more money. Right. It's just, you know, if you start if you start in that process sooner than later, it's gonna, it's you're, you're gonna have less problems. Yeah. But um, most of the time I write to visuals is kind of the easy. Okay. Right, right. Um, has um you know, if um if you had to name three or five of the best. And most impactful on the film, on the and the and the emotional impact or the impact of the film, uh, scores, and don't include your own because you wouldn't anyway. Uh, but what would they be? Ones that we would either in of history, all time, you mean? Oh yeah, of all time oh, or geez. something recent or. Oh man, that's that's like a smorgasbord. You know, like <laughs> what do you want? Do you want to, you know, do you want to go for the salad first or the dessert first? All right. Well, let's do this. Let's, uh, if you were a 14 to 18 year old, yeah. me in the building. Yeah. What, what, what would you, what would you gravitate towards? Yeah. What, I think what, it would be a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new, you know, yeah. um, you know, I think if you look at any of the star Wars franchise, talk about, you know, an absolutely fantastic, great action adventure store score that's memorable. Um, you know, John John Williams has written 27 hours of music 
for the Star Wars series going back to the 70s. Right. And remember, all of nine Beethoven symphonies are only seven hours. Wow. Wow. So it's so the volume of music is just is just astonishing. So I mean, you know, that's the action genre. Um, you know, I love Ennio Morricone's music. Once a time, Once Upon a Time in America, those kind of shows. And then I love soundtrack movies. You know, right. like Goodfellas doesn't have a. I don't think it has a single note of original music in it. Right. It's all it's all needle drop songs supervised by Robbie Robertson of the band. Yeah. And you know, the, I think the choices are brilliant. It's a different kind of movie experience. Same with Tarantino. You know, Tarantino most of the time does soundtrack movies. Um, the few exceptions, but you know, he is a really tuned into music and cuts his films to the pieces that he ends up using. So right. um, it's a giant world out there. You know, it's it's a world of 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 original scores and it's a world of soundtrack and it's there's something for everybody. You know. Yeah. So what was it like for you to make that turn from uh, being the composer to being the producer director? Well, that kind of came out of necessity. The first, the film I made about my late mother, Rosalie, was actually completed in, I forget what year it was, 13, I think. And we presented it to the distributors, we presented it to PBS and all these people, nobody wanted it because it was cut in a very unusual way. It was beautifully done, but um, at the end of the day, nobody wanted it. And PBS said, well, if you change this list of 20 things, we'll, we'll air it. So I went back and did a page one recut, hired a picture editor and took a co-directing credit because we spent another six months going back, completely recut the film, went to Rome, shot pickups, um, rescored the whole thing and uh, presented to PBS and they immediately said yes. And it aired for two years on PBS, right. including a lot of channels in Michigan. Great. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that project? Yeah, so that was um, when Rosalie died in 06, I wrote a Requiem for her, which is, you know, Mass for the Dead. It's a it's a mm -hmm. basically Mass for the Dead set to music. And so, you know, Mozart wrote a famous one. You know, Brahms wrote a famous one. Um, Verdi wrote an iconic one. And, you've, you know, everybody's heard the music from Requiems, even if they don't know it. So anyway, um, we premiered the Requiem got invited to go to Carnegie Hall and premiere it with 200 voices, 50 orchestra, including 60 children. And then a festival in Vatican City called Musica Sacra found out about us and invited us over to premiere it there at their festival. So uh, most of the singers from the Carnegie Hall performance flew to Rome and, and their families. And my entire extended family, uh, my two brothers and my sister and all the kids went over and went to the premiere. And a, and a camera crew followed us. So the movie talks about, you know, the trip, it's kind of a road trip thing. And there's rehearsals in different cities. The choir came from all over the United States. My family came over and it's a story about how I dealt with loss, who Rosalie was. There's some footage of Rosalie and her, her life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was just one of those things that just sort of, it kind of grew. I thought, wow, this sounds, this sounds like a documentary. And 10 years later, it ended up on the air and it was all kind of a long process so yeah no yeah. Well, I remember that I remember you know obviously I, re I remember your mother's passing and and then and then the project and uh, yeah. and and then seeing it of course uh, not only was it incredibly moving uh, but also made uh, you know every son in the world other than you feel like not worthy <laughs> <laughs> well you know and what do we do what now was, <laughs> and what I realized was it's you know it was about my grief and stuff like that and 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 what I hoped it does is inspire people to do something, you know, yep, dedicate yep. to park bench or endow a scholarship yep. or, you know, do something in, 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 in the name of somebody that you lost. Not, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, something on that grand of a scale is a little ambitious and, you know, you can do that too, or something even bigger than I did. Yep. Um, but it's really just, you know, it's, it's sort of a call to action for, beautiful. you know, dealing with loss. It really is beautiful. So. Hey, hey, can you talk a little bit about, I was, I was reading a little bit about some of the other things that you're up to, I don't know where you're finding the time, other than yeah. your kids are right. out of high school and in college. So, Correct. Um, you know, tell us about uh, Source in Sync and M Vibe. So those are two music licensing companies I started. Um, Source in Sync is a music library. So it's basically a bunch of music I've written over the last 15 years. Uh, I'm just releasing my 76th CD. So that music goes all over the world and then it gets used in film, TV, um, you know, just little needle drop pieces, little individual clips, little individual songs, you know, movies like from everything from, uh, I had two pieces of music in uh, Nomadland that just won best picture, best director, best Nomad. screenplay. Yeah. 
Huh. And then like Dallas Buyers Club uses it. And then a bunch of big TV shows use it. So that kind of thing. And then M Vibe is actually something I just started. That's the largest collection of cover recordings of hit songs in the world. So we have 100,000 versions of alternate versions of hit songs. So if you want yeah. a version of a Rolling Stones song sung by a girl with a ukulele, we might have one. Wow. Or a string quartet doing Britney Spears or just, you know, oddball stuff that gets used in film. So if you turn on NFL football on Sunday, you'll hear, you know, a cover of um, a Fleetwood Mac song done with a large string orchestra. Well, that's right. that's kind of our business. Wow. So, yeah, we do. We're, we're in that world. Fascinating. And how did you and, how did you get into that? Um, kind of by necessity. I was doing these low budget movies in the 90s and they would have all these expensive songs cut in that they could never use. So I ended up writing oh, stuff right, that right. sounded like the flavor. So they needed a, you know, 70s um, soul track. I could write, I could wear the hat, hire the players and write something that sounded like a B-side, you know. And right. so, and then the covers are the actual song, but a different recording other than the original band master. Yep. Right. It's a, just a different take on the song. It's still owned by the person who wrote it. It's still owned by the band, the underlying copyright, but it's a new recording, a new version of the song. Wow. And there's millions of covers floating around. I'm sure. Millions and millions and millions. It's amazing. Yeah. When, when Taylor Swift records a new song, within a couple of weeks, there's 2,000 versions up on YouTube sung by <laughs> kids all over the world. You know, some of them, you know, the dog barking in the background. You can't use them for what we do, but right, just right. to give you an idea of how, how it propagates itself. So, well, well, speaking of kids, um, you know, in garages playing music in high school. So, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your your time here at Green Hills, and and music, and uh, how whatever happened here, yeah. uh, you know, catapulted. The, well, the Reader's Digest condensed version is in in when I graduated in 1980, they had no jazz band, so I actually was in the Huron High School jazz band. So uh -huh. my dad would take me to Huron at 6.30 in the morning for, for band practice. And then, or by the time, you know, I got, I got my license in 10th grade. So I guess I had to I did drive myself eventually, but, but I was actually in Huron's band because they didn't have any equivalent program, but I was in the musicals at Green Hills. Right. Um, and, you know, sang and acted in them. And my mother was a music director. So I've got super eight film of me singing Brush Up Your Shakespeare from Kiss Me Kate with my mom conducting the orchestra, right. <laughs> which is actually in the documentary. Um, right. so, you know, that, and then, you know, my friends were so all into music and, um, you know, so we had, you know, we had the, the music of our people, you know, we were big Motown fans. We were big classic rock fans. Yeah. And then I was also studying piano and playing in competitions and learning Bach, Beethoven, Brown, Mozart, Chopin and mm -hmm. doing that. And then ended up majoring in piano and undergrad. So, right. um, you know, so there was, you know, it was, music was, was, you know, what I was doing all the time anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we have, you know, we have a great jazz band here. It's amazing. Uh, Which number, just blows number my mind. Of, I just think it's so cool. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of them actually. And and it's uh it's really exciting to matter of fact, it was it was really fun. Um because of COVID uh and ventilation that we're using in the school, uh, and kids are masked, uh, the doors are open everywhere. And the doors in the music rooms are open. So in the dining hall, we actually get to listen to the jazz band. <laughs> it's almost like we're sort of doing dinner theater. Like you always hear music coming out. But um, you know, if uh, if you're a kid here and you're in the jazz band, and and uh, what uh, what advice would you have? Like if you wanted to sort of have a career as a musician or in the music business, uh, don't do it. <laughs> so, um, I think, you know, the thing that's so great about the, the, this age group is that they have access to literally everything, which is a, mm. kind of a good news, bad news, because there's so much music out there. There's not enough bandwidth for any human to take in even a small percentage of it. But, you know, I always say, go to your jam, go to what you love and really get, get good at it. You know, um, that's what Lynn Manuel, Lynn Manuel, Lynn manuel Miranda said, which is that right. you know, he started writing musical stuff and nobody was paying attention to him because he was a Puerto Rican kid. Mm -hmm. And he just got better than everybody. You know, he went on his own and locked himself in a room and just did it all day, every day for years and years before he started to get noticed and started to have shows go up in New York. I mean, it wasn't like he just fell off a log and was suddenly writing Hamilton. Right. And he completely changed. You no, know, he did something that's his style that is 
completely game changed Broadway, you know? So, you know, if you're that person or if you're, you know, you're trying to be a creative person, just do something that, that, that is you do you and be better at it than anybody. And mm -hmm. you can literally, you know, write your own ticket, you know? Yeah. Especially now, you know, cause the, there's no barriers to entry for, for gear. There's no barriers of entry of putting your stuff on um, streamers. Doesn't mean you'll make any money doing it, but there's, you know, before you, know, you had to get a record deal, you had to book expensive time in a studio. Now everything's available. So there's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great news for young people that want to, you know, get good at their craft right. because it's available to them, you know, and the friends play other instruments. They can have their friends play on their stuff and mm -hmm. create little bands. You know, that's where a lot of these bands come from. It's just kids, you, you know, the Rolling Stones were buddies. They rode the bus together in the 1960s and they're like, hey, I'm starting a band. You want to be in it? Like, sure. They had no idea. They were a cover band. They were playing other people's blues tunes. Right. Same with the Beatles. Same with, you know, a lot of the big acts. There's a Maroon 5 started at Brentwood School here in L.A. Mm -hmm. They went to their Malibu kids. And they just started jamming. You know, a lot of people, do, I mean, a lot, I had a band at Green Hills with a couple what of friends. What was his name? What was the name? I don't know. It was a couple of guys, Dave Stone and Mike Hansen, and we'd go jam yeah. in a basement. And yeah. Play, you know, It Never Rains in California and play these crazy tunes and just, you know, learn how to try to play together you know right learn how to how to be an ensemble and how to you know how to listen to each other and how to communicate musically with each other do you, you know? have any do you have any uh like cassette tapes or no not of that i have cassette thing? tapes of college but not of anything high school we never got that far right you know we just jammed for fun in, literally in a basement yeah huh and do your yeah. uh, your kids play are they musical uh they play a little piano and they both have good voices and throughout their lives they often got pulled into the studio and i'd say hey sing this line right so their voice has been on um tv and movies um my younger daughter has a had a hit ad campaign in uh netherlands for some christmas uh song that she did wow. so you know it's weird like <laughs> that stuff just happens you know well that's great well so what's the one thing that we should look forward to from you in the near future. Well, I just directed my second feature documentary that is um, that is uh, distributed around the world. We still don't have a deal in the United States yet. It's called Syndrome K. It's a story of um, three doctors in a Roman hospital during the Nazi occupation in World War II that made up a fake disease that saved the Roman Jews from being deported to Auschwitz. It's a true story. Whoa. And I found out about it by mistake and tried to go find the movie about it and there was no movie and you know i the rosie's documentary requiem i'd also made in vatican city and so i was and i also i'm a citizen of italy which is a whole other side story because rosie was sicilian now i have a red passport and so do my children but um so i found out about the story and i said oh i'm gonna go see this documentary this is fascinating sounds kind of like Schindler's list looked on amazon you know, you know hulu netflix nothing I said, I'm going to make this film. I made a decision, you know, a life decision, an aha moment in five minutes. I said, I'm going to make this, somehow I'm going to make this film. So wow. I did some research and the doctor who made up the fake disease, Dr. Ozicini, was 98 years old and still living in Rome. No kidding. So I booked the next flight, hired an Italian crew, flew over and interviewed him, plus two Roman Jews that are survivors in their 80s, plus the son of one of the other doctors who was in his 80s and, you know, got them all, they're all Italians, all Romans none of them speak English. And, uh, and then I amassed a bunch of um, archival footage from, the, you know, Pathé and Luce and a bunch of the big European archives, including German right. archives, and made this feature length film. And so and now we're trying to make a movie based on the same story. Right. So, so and when, if, when will we be able to see it here? I don't I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. We don't have a deal here yet. Okay. Um, but uh, the really cool stories are three doctors Ozicini, and then there was another Dr. Borromeo who, who was much older. He would, he'd be over 120 now if he was. He was born in the 1890s, I believe. And there's another doctor, Dr. Sacerdoti, who was actually born in Modena and moved to Rome. And he was actually an Italian Jew who moved to Rome and they hired him at a Catholic hospital and they gave him a fake passport, fake identity, fake papers. And he was practicing medicine in a Catholic hospital and saving members of his own family. It's just remarkable. I mean, I just heard this and I was like, this is just too good. Like, wow. 
it's the greatest elevator pitch ever, right? You know, right, three right. doctors made up a fake disease that fooled the SS. Like, how, awesome. I mean, the best villain ever in, in the but history. It's got to be a movie. I mean, it has to be a movie. It's got to be. So we actually have a script, and we're actually set up at a big agency here called CAA Creative Artists, and they're helping us. So we've right. got directors reading it right now. So we'll see. You know that. That's a little tougher not to crack because I made the movie on my own, yeah. the, the documentary on my own. Right. But making making a dramatic feature film is, you know, that takes uh, real money. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting, though. Pretty exciting to be a part of it and to be the right. originator of it. Right. I just couldn't believe that nobody had made this movie. You know, here I am, seventy five years later, and I found just discovered this right. you know, needle in a haystack. It's awesome. Well, good so luck. I wrote the music for it. So. Yeah. So if you go to syndromek.com, you can find out a little more information about it. Okay. We've been playing a lot of Jewish film festivals in the United States. Okay. And COVID shut every single one of them down. I played the Miami Jewish Film Festival in January of 20 or 19. I can't even remember. Was it January of 20? Mm -hmm. It must have been January of 20, right? Because they locked us down in March of 20. Right. So, and so, you maybe, know, I went. Maybe you can screen it here. I, I would love to, you know, I'd love to screen it there. So, right. you know, we, we could absolutely do that. And okay. then, um, um, and then I, I screened in Miami and then everything shut down. And then all the film festivals I've played since have been just like we are here. Um, yeah. They watch the film and then we have a Q&A with me just on, you know, with Great. the audience, whoever wants to do it. So I've done a bunch of those. And we'll all be right, doing we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. I think yeah. this sounds brilliant. Yeah, the, the history bus. Really, I mean, it's like a History Channel doc. It's just really yeah. fascinating. And nobody knows the story. Like yeah. we walked around the Jewish ghetto of Rome talking to elders that didn't know about. So yeah. it's uh, it is a it is a secret war, World War II story, but which right. is all the more fascinating so. and not to be secret for much longer. So. Yeah, the, it's you know it's and I I found a YouTube link from one of my distributors and three hundred fifteen thousand people had watched it. Wow! So it's getting out there. So the so, story is going wide. So. Well, you heard it here first, Americans ah. <laughs> and, and Green Hills community. And, you know, Stephen, this has been such a pleasure. It's great to, to talk with you, hear about the amazing things that you're doing and the way you're doing it. And you make us proud. And uh, it's so good to see you again. And back at you. And uh, I can't wait to come back to Ann Arbor and maybe do a hang at the school and see the building because I haven't seen the building since before the big redo. So I am definitely long overdue for a trip. Can't wait to have you. You're always welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Bye, Steve. Delighted.